And welcome back to Dirt to Dust. It's Friday, and that can only mean one thing. Well, I mean, it can mean a couple things. But in our, for our intents and purposes, it means it is time for the Dirt to Dust mailbag. Caleb, I, man, it's Friday, so I really hope you have some really good questions for me this week. What do you got? How you doing today? I've got some uh, great questions. The first question I've got is, uh, what kind of coffee are you drinking this morning? Uh, so, okay, all right. I've already had the first cup. So, and it was, oh, what was it? Some kind of cappuccino. I don't know. It was in my sweet racer coffee mug that we got out at KOH. I made it in the, uh, the coffee. You mug. mean, you mean this sweet racer right. coffee Never mug? Never mind. Mine was different. Mine was like <laughs> coffee mug with the handle. Uh, I love that. Oh, it's yeah. Different. I freaking love that. We use the, the, I can't even remember what they are. My wife loves these, these, these coffee mugs that fit in our, we have an espresso maker at the house that does like mm-hmm. it automatically does the milk and it automatically you just kind of pour oh, it. Yeah. And it's like swig life, swig, something like that. And she loved mm-hmm. it. And we have them. And when I came home with that racer coffee one, I was like, I mean, the swig is nice, but this racer coffee cup is, man, it is the truth. But now it's kind of right. mid morning. So I've kind of switched to the water bottle. It's like this little flavored <laughs> water bottle. You put these, you put these little flavor things in there. And today I've got mm-hmm. cherry limeade. So. Uh, nice. Yeah, I'm loud. I'm still working on uh, coffee number one. It is uh, a local company here called Black Powder Coffee in Mooresville, North Carolina. Oh, Very good. Powder. I see what you did. Uh, it's pretty solid. I see what you did. Yeah, Black Powder. Right. Yeah, but Ooh, the, my racer got- coffee cup special because it's got a it's got a drive over mark from the race car. You ran it over on accident. I wait. What I did. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's got a dent in the bottom of the of the cup because uh, I accidentally left it on the tire and you drove away. And uh, oh, we were, so I got a custom racer coffee cup for sure. Uh, nice, hell yeah! But hell yeah. yeah, always always good to have a little coffee talk. Nice before you well, jump in. So you know that originally, like the OG racer coffee cup, like that thing. Just I don't even know where that went. I bought another one this year. That's the one with the hand. Ah, uh, okay. No, so this is the OG from I the first time I went to handlers with anymore. You. I've kept it. They didn't have one this year either. I went looking and it was some barbecue company, some meat smoking company they started that they were doing on the 20 ounce tumblers. But yeah, sadly, sadly, no 20 ounce tumbler had to go with a, with a coffee cup. Mm -hmm. It's been good. So, and I'm going to need it because I think this week we've got, I know we've got some great questions. I'm kind of taking a peek at them, Um, but unbeknownst to you, I just got another question. So I think we're going to have four. So uh, let's jump right in here and uh, yeah, let's get going on the mailbag. When other people see dirt, you see glory. And when you see a vehicle for the first time, your first thought is not how pretty it is, but how much abuse can it take? This is Dirt to Dust, presented by Outlaw Off-Road. If it's anything off-road and dirty, we probably like it, and we're probably talking about it. You'll get industry info, tech talk, and interviews with the biggest and best in the industry. Let's do it. This is Dirt to Dust. And now your hosts, Doug Langford and Caleb Forbes. All right. Welcome back to the Friday mailbag. Doug, are you ready for some questions? Shoot. Let's go. All right. Number one, we've got from Kevin G. This was from the Gladiators Only Group. They've, they've come out with some pretty good questions for us lately. Uh, he said, what do I need to do to put the sway bar release from a Rubicon on my sport? Oh, okay. Yeah. So this has actually gotten pretty popular where they want to take um, – the Rubicon, so in the JL and JT, it's pretty much the same. It's electronic. Um, mm-hmm. It was in the JK2. And you get that from the factory and the Mojave 2 and the Gladiator. Um, and the Sport doesn't have that. It's just a solid bar um, that unless you go in with wrenches and ratchets, it's it's not coming disconnected, which um, mm-hmm. some people do. And there's also a lot of people that just buy disconnects. Um, it's not that popular of a swap just cause it, it gets kind of expensive. I think some people have a very highly inflated view of what these electronic sway bar disconnects should be because in the factory ones, they have that button in the dash. It's already there. You just hit a button and it goes automatically. Um, once you put that into a sport, a Sahara an altitude or whatever that doesn't have it, um, you've got to do some wiring. So if you know how to do that, um, I mean, it mounts, it pretty much mounts right up. 
Um, it, that motor does get a little bit in the way and makes that little plastic skid up front behind the bumper a little more important um, or the aftermarket ones that have some metal ones that are a little bit better. So it does mount right up to the same spot. So you can bolt it up. Just know that you're going to have to do some wiring. You have to put it on a switch. You're going to do something like that um, to get that thing to actually connect um, to connect and disconnect. But people have done it. It's been a thing. Um, you just gonna have to do a little work to make it happen. You know, me personally, I just say buy a couple of, unless you're getting it for free from a buddy or something, I would just say buy some disconnects. But I know, I know these days people just want to hit a button and get going. So I can right. see it if you're getting it for dirt cheap or free, but otherwise just buy some disconnects. Right. And, and there's definitely some, some time involved wiring that the other suggestion I would have, um, Curry anti rock sway bar is a proven thing. You can adjust the stiffness. You can put it to a stiffer setting if you want or a looser setting. And then you don't have to get out. You don't have to touch a button. You don't have to do anything. You just ride. Yeah, I'm a fan um, of the Curry. So, there, so that, I'm, I'm a huge fan of the Curry. I've got Curry's going on front and rear on the LJ. Um, I, so I see spot. no problem with it. <laughs> I don't want to get out and disconnect right, anything. I just, want to, I just want to go hit stuff. Um, cool. So that one, that's simple. Uh, so then this one is a an actual message that we got in. Um, to dirt to dust. So thank you for sending in your messages for one. Uh, we definitely love seeing these and uh, we definitely love answering your questions directly. Um, this is from Jason. He says, I have a 2021 Jeep Wrangler Freedom Edition two liter turbo. What gear ratio do I need to run 35 inch tall tires? This is a question we've answered probably a couple times already, but one more doesn't hurt. Well, and everything's different, right? Like, you know, right. I would give a different answer if they said they were running a three six. Um, the two O. I mean, I'm having this issue right now with with my Jeep trying to figure out gear ratios because I could actually make the argument in in the new Jeep because of the chassis and all of that and what what tire size I'm going. I could make the argument two different ways. Um, so because it's a two O, uh, even though it's a two O, it's still got an eight speed. So typically, if you came to me with the regular Jeep and you said, "Hey, I'm going to run thirty fives," I would typically say four eighty eights. Um, and everybody says, well, it's three, but it's 33s and it's four tens in the Rubicon. And I understand, and I get that, but you also have to understand from the factory 33, it's not actually a 33. It's like a 32 and three quarter, but it's also a, it's a C range. It's a lot, about a light as you're going to get. It's also a lot narrower to 285, which means 11, just over 11 inches, not a 12 and a half wide or a 13 and a half inch wide. And the wheels are generally going to get changed, which goes from like a six and a half to seven and a half wide to like a nine to 10 wide. What does that change? Well, it changes weight. It changes weight. And when you change weight, you've got to account for that in gear ratio. So if, if somebody's coming to me normally on a JL, JT, and they say, you know, 35s, I'm going to say 488. The reason I might not go 488 in this case is because of the 2.0. The 2.0 changes things. It's got a turbo. There are things that are different, and I can see the argument being made quite easily um, for 456s. If you're just going lift wheels, tires, then I could absolutely see telling you 456. The only difference here why I would maybe say 488 is, and I would have to just ask questions. If you tell me I'm going front bumper and a winch, I'm going to throw a rear bumper on there. I'm going to throw some sliders on there. I'm going to keep my spare tire and put a spare tire carrier on there and all this kind of stuff. Then I'm probably going to explain a little more the adva the advantages of going 488. So the simple answer in this specific one, if you're adding a bunch of weight that wasn't there from the factory, look at 488. If you're not going to add a bunch of weight that wasn't there at the factory, 456, only because of the 2.0 turbo. If it was a 3.6, it'd be a different conversation. But because of the 2.0 turbo, that's where I'm going on that. Yeah, I 100% agree. And I always tend to recommend gears one step above anyways. Because, uh, yes, you say 35s now, but the the odds and possibility of you putting 37s on in the future with a JL are pretty high. Just because the 37 fits so dang well in that wheel well. Uh, you don't have to do any kind of cutting or trimming to make that happen with, you know, the right suspension. Um, so yeah, yeah. I agree. 488 is a, is a good solid way to go. It gives you some room in the future too. If, uh, if you decide to upgrade and when you're not right. going to lose eighth gear on that one. Right. Um, sweet. Moving right along. So, um, they're easy. These are easy. A, yeah. Today's a, today's an easy one. Uh, so a different gladiator group, there's probably, I don't know. I think I've been added to 14 of these at this point. Um, so a different gladiator group than the first one. This is from Ruben H. Um, what is the correct air pressure for 37 inch tires when driving on the highway? Oh boy. 
What is answer what is, is pick a number? Like that's the short answer, right? The real right. answer there is there is no real answer. So right. tire pressure is extremely setup dependent. The the the, the inches tall tell has nothing to do with the tire pressure that you should be running. It does not, it is not affected by whether it is a 33, 35, any of that. In fact, it would be more, it would be more effective by what's the size of the wheel telling me how much sidewall I have more so than what's the size of the overall tire. Why is that weight? How much weight is sitting on that tire? Um, if, if you give me a gladiator that is a factory gladiator, same tire, same wheel setup, but you put a rooftop tent in it and a bunch of stuff in the back. Now the tire pressure that I'm going to need to do that I'm going to need changes. So um, in general, the tire pressure that you're going to want is going to be lower than what the factory sends you. And that's for one reason and one reason only cafe standards. You are going to be the most efficient on fuel economy. If you can reduce rolling resistance, friction, inertia, all of those things. So factory tires will tend to be a little slightly 10 to 15% over inflated makes the tire harder, makes the tire set up more, and you're going to get less rolling resistance. Therefore, you're going to be able to get a little better fuel economy. We're not talking about a ton, but we're talking about enough that saves them hundreds of thousands of dollars. We're talking about a lot of money here just by them being able to eke out an extra one to mile and a half on your fuel economy. So once you get that, that really doesn't apply to you anymore. So you can start looking at things like rod quality and whatnot. The problem there is, in general, if you, if you do what's called a chalk test, which... Google that. I'm not going to go into a chalk test, but Google it, do a chalk test. If you go in and, and you come out that it's like 31 PSI and you go to do that in a JL or a JT or even a JK, um, you're going to get the TPMS light um, and it's going to tell you to air up your tires. So you you need to account for that. You're going to need to get, get a shop that can reprogram the threshold. You can do that. It's fine. Don't worry about it. It's not like, you know, I, I can see people out there right now going, well, if I go below the factory recommended tire pressure, I'm going to hurt. No, you're not going to hurt anything. I promise. <laughs> you're not. This is all because of stuff that you as the end user generally don't care about. And it's generally not going to affect you. So you can buy programmers. You can do the J scan. You can do the um, what's the taser, um, the super chips, flash cal, all of those, whatever does that, you can change that threshold or you can turn it off completely. And once you do the chalk test, maybe it's 27, maybe it's 28, maybe it's 30, 31, but do that chalk test. And, 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 you know, if you really want to get it right, treat the front and the rear independently of each other, instead of trying to find one, you know, we do that in the race car front tire pressures are always different than the rear tire pressures. Even though we're relatively balanced, we're really, really well balanced, probably better, probably better balanced in race trim than they are from the factory. We still treat the front and the rear differently because the front and the rear do things differently. Um, yeah. So, but on the highway, maybe that's less, but do the chalk test, Google that chalk test, chalk test, um, do a chalk test on your tires for your specific setup, for your specific tire, irregard, regardless, not irregardless, regardless, yeah, not irregardless, regardless. your tire <laughs> size, it does not matter whether it's 33s or 42s, do a chalk test, do a chalk mm -hmm. test, do a chalk test. And if it does come down, if it does end up being lower than what your threshold is, definitely look into a taser. Um, we did, I did the we'll same be thing. Lower. For, we'll yeah. absolutely be um, low. I did the exact same thing for Brittany's JL. Yeah. Um, we put, I put 35s on there, some MTs. Um, originally, I want to say I had like 30 or 32 pounds in them, and they uh, it rode a little funky. And I was like, what's going on? Why are these tires wearing a little bit? And um, so I did chalk test. <laughs> and uh, turns out 26 ish was like the perfect. It was wearing incredibly well. Super Are smooth. E range? Are they E range tires? Um, you know, I'm not sure. I think they might be they're D. Gladiators, aren't they? No, they're not gladiators. What they're are they? uh, Her Hercules. Hercules. That's it's, right. It's a uh, AT American Tires, one of their in house brands. Okay. Well, and that's what you got to remember too. Like sidewall matters. Like C range mm -hmm. versus D range versus E range. Don't get F range. Um, the sidewall mm -hmm. stiffness. So when you if you get an E range tire, you're gonna have to drop that pressure even lower than you would on like a D mm -hmm. or a C or an SL or whatever range right. because of that sidewall stiffness. And also keep in mind that the day you buy your load range D or load range E's, that's the stiffest they're going to be. So if you do a chalk test the day after you buy your load range E tires, and I'm not recommending buying load range E tires, but I also understand that right. certain manufacturers only make certain tread patterns 
in certain si- and I get that. Um, right. but keep that in mind after several hundred miles, you're going to want to chalk test that again, because again. you could mm-hmm. go out, excuse me, you could go outside one morning and be like, why does my tires look flat? You're not flat. It's just because your sidewall's broken finally. Mm-hmm. And you may have to bring that tire pressure up. So if you do get yeah. a D range or a C range, an eight ply, 10 ply, make sure that if you're doing them when they're new, chalk test it again after, I don't know, yeah. 500 to a thousand miles, something like that. Yeah. And bring them up. Yeah. Like I said, Brits came in at like 26 and which triggered the light. So mm-hmm. uh, you got a taser. I want to say the taser mini. Um, yeah, so taser. it does everything she wants it to do. There's, there's, I mean, it does pretty much everything. It, it's incredible what these little things do, but I think we just disabled it completely. Um, that way it just doesn't de on us at all. So, yeah, that's right. Um, generally do. I understand. Like no. I do understand wanting to have the TPMS. Um, it's good and bad. Like it's good because if you don't really want to check your tire pressure, you're not that kind of person, but you want to know if like you got a nail in your tire, but then it's bad because like my wife's expedition, she right now has a nail in her tire and I know there's a nail in the tire. It's already scrubbed the head off. It's in there. It's not coming out. Right. I've seen enough, like everybody's like, oh, you gotta get the nail. No, people, I've seen enough nails and tires. This one's fine. But she called me one morning and she says, Hey, just so you know, like one of my tires, she has gone down to like 29. And hers run at like 32 or 33. And it was, she's like, you know, the threshold was 30 and it dropped below the threshold. I was like, okay, well, let me look at it. She sent me a picture. I was like, okay, it's fine. Like she always, you know, she has a spare in there. I gave, you know, she has a can of fix a flat, like a roadside kit. So if anything did happen, I was like, just have that. I don't think it's going to be a problem. We already have it on the schedule to get, you know, lift wheels and tires done. I'm like, there's no reason for me to take it from you just to pull a nail to put a plug in. I actually trust that nail sitting in there enveloped in rubber right now more than I would after I ream that sucker out and put a, uh, a plug in there. So in that case, TPMS was good. She's not a, you know, a car guru, right? She's just a normal person. And it at least let her know that there was a situation. She went and she found that if she wasn't already on the schedule for wheels and tires, she would have known, Hey, I need to take this somewhere and get this tire plugged um, when it's convenient for me versus, you know, being left on the side of the road. So I get the argument for keeping the TPMS system, but if you're that type of person, but also don't worry if you do get a taser or a flash cal or a J scan or whatever, don't be too upset about just killing the system completely. I don't remember the last car. And so in the taser system, you can actually, you can kill just the, uh, pressure threshold right but keep tpms and that's what we did so i eliminated the chime and the pressure threshold so it doesn't light up your dash whenever you're oh we get a flat tire uh but she can go through her her steering wheel functions and look at tire pressure anytime she wants so that worked out funny story though in in similar aspects of this uh question we had a had a customer come in i was at the charlotte shop taking some pictures customer comes in and she said, Hey, my, uh, my Jeep's riding like really, really, really rough. I just got tires put on it down the road. Like, I don't trust those guys. Like, can you take a look at it? It's, it's all over the place. And we're like, Oh gosh. Like, so we, we shake down suspension. We look at everything. Everything was perfectly tight. And we're like, what's going on? And then I look at the tire and I'm like, yo, um, that thing's riding on about an inch of rubber in the middle on 35 inch tall tires. We checked tire pressure 50 four pounds in each tire because clearly it's an f-350 towing twenty thousand pounds on a gooseneck clearly right and so we i was like yeah no wonder this lady's all over the road she's got zero contact patch uh so we lowered it down and and then immediately she's like she called back you know 15 minutes later she's like this is amazing you guys are great i'm bringing it back for everything like yep great thank you little things matter. people <laughs> don't realize it. little things matter and and you know i see it every day of people on you know the so-called facebook the facebook experts oh that's not that big of a deal you can do this you can do that and i just want to say i just want to throw punch them and say shut up <laughs> just because like you just don't know like i am not a doctor right i know that i am not a doctor so i am not going to try and diagnose you even though i know how to google and use webmd that does not give me the right to diagnose a serious medical condition or anything like that but for some reason, people think that they're that they're off road doctors. And I just think it's 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 both equal parts funny and annoying as crap at the same time, because these people get on their keyboards and they've, they've had this one experience or their buddy's a mechanic and they just think they know everything. And you're like, dude, you're actually going to get somebody hurt or you're actually oh, going to yeah. make somebody think they wasted all this money when they didn't or make them spend money when they don't need to. And they're just, mm-hmm. there's, there's a, uh, you know, what's that? That's that the thing from the movie back in the nineties, whatever I see dead people. It's like, I feel like I see no all the time. Oh, Hey, hey hold, on, hold, on, hold, on, we got something. hold on. We got something here. We got a fourth question. I just got a notice off the, so off this week's episode, R and D 
We did the podcast episode. It came out on Wednesday. Uh, we just got a comment that came across. I was actually looking um, uh, at my phone, and I just got a notification from a Sergeant Major Scott on YouTube. He posted a comment and says, uh, Doug, can you talk about the JT Mojave? Yes, Sergeant Major Scott, I absolutely can talk about the JT Mojave. Looking at drive shafts, and in quotations he puts Adams, and as building it, I've noticed with its suspension a lot is different or specific. Somewhat true. Mm -hmm. What should you run on a Mojave and lengths? Okay. Well, I can I can actually answer something pretty quick. I, I, I had a J2 Mojave. I'm pretty familiar with them. Um, so, so Sergeant Major Scott, um, I hope that was an Army Sergeant Major and not a Marine Sergeant Major. Just I, that's just me. Sorry. <laughs> um, so uh, when it comes to the differences in the Mojave, um, mechanically, it's really just the front shocks, the hole, the mounting hole in the shocks is 14 millimeter uh, rather than 12 millimeter. And that's because of the, the they're basically Fox performance elite level shocks that come in the Mojave. Um, mm -hmm. The line's a little different because of where they put the resi. And they're not adjustable like the performance elites, but the shock is basically a no CD adjuster Fox performance elite, um, which is cool because they're rebuildable. They got the bigger shafts, all that kind of stuff. So they're, they're good shock. They're great shock. But the mounting hole um, in the bearings top and bottom is, is bigger. So mm -hmm. that's one difference. Um, so that's, that's kind of the difference. And they're already kind of lifted. I mean, I say lifted, they're just the higher you know, and then there's some aesthetic differences with the hood and the cowl and all that. But the rules for drive shafts apply um, on the front is generally where people look first. Those rules apply evenly across the board, whether it is a Rubicon, Sahara, Sport, it doesn't matter. And a lot of people will say, well, over a certain amount of lift, you got to do it. And that's not entirely inaccurate, but the best way to do this, and this is for you if you have a J2 Mojave. This is if you have a JL Sport. It does not matter. Look at your shocks. Look at your front shocks. If your front shock extended length, so when that when that shock is fully extended, if it is over 29 and a half inches, over 29 and a half inches, you need to think about a front drive shaft. And why do I say think? Well, in the in the the vast majority of JLs and JTs, they have that center axle disconnect. So the front drive shaft isn't spinning. So if you're just on the highway all the time, your front drive shaft's never going to spin or it's never going to spin. If you go in four wheel drive and you spin that drive shaft and you actually go to flexing it out, that 29.6 and plus on the shock is going to allow that axle to droop to a level where instead of the drive shaft being like, you know, like this, it's going to be like this, you know, and this is that joint out of the transfer case. And the more, it, more that joint bends, the more you're putting that in a bind. And when you put it in a bind, that's when you start messing with the joint. So, um, you know, that, that, that answer goes across the board. So just look at your front shocks. If they're over 29 and a half inches extended and you're going to off-road it, go ahead and buy a drive shaft. If you don't, don't lose sleep. The drive shaft is going to let you know when it's going, if you're going to go wheel it, cause it's going to start clicking when it's in four wheel drive and you're going to know, Hey, it's time to replace my drive shaft. But if you're one of those people that's like, I just don't want to deal with it. I'm more of a do it now. So I don't have to deal with it later. Look at the front shock. If you meet those criteria, you're going to put it in four wheel drive. Your front shocks are over 29 and a half inches extended. Go ahead and get a drive shaft. That's, that's the answer to that one. So that was our fourth question. So easy. I like it. I like getting into more of the technical questions. Hopefully we get more of those. And um, yeah, as, as the, as the episodes roll out, I expect to see more and more comments on Facebook. Um, Similar to the uh, Let's Get After It episode on Outlaw Off Roads channel, it's got oh, yeah. hundreds of gear comments. I mean, every oh, single day. Uh, I can't keep up with them. So I, I expect to see some pretty cool questions come through once these episodes start taking off. Um, gotcha. Yeah, and um, and that they will because some of them are already <laughs> already are doing pretty great, which I'm I'm pretty proud of. So, but I think that is uh, I think Doug, I think that's it for the day, man. Yeah, that's it, man. It, we got, I got a Friday afternoon to go deal with and go get out and enjoy the weekend before we come back next week and and do another episode. I am thinking, uh, based on some current events, uh, that we're going to change it up a little bit and we are going to do an episode on recovery next week. Ooh, I like um, it. Yep, we do have Dan Four from Next Venture Motorsports scheduled to interview him next week, so we will be that will be the podcast that comes out on March twentieth, that Wednesday. 
So look okay. forward to that one on the 20th. And I think we're going to, we're going to call a little bit of an audible for next week and do an episode on recovery. So everybody make sure to tune in on that. Like the, like the videos, like the channel, like the podcast, all that stuff, comment up, get the comments in there. Maybe it, maybe it becomes a mailbag question and subscribe. So, you know, when these episodes are coming out, we're throwing out two a week. So make sure that you're subscribing and giving us that five-star review on Apple podcast. That will make sure that these are getting out to other people who, cause we all know everybody needs to hear this stuff. <laughs> everybody needs to hear this stuff. Yeah. And we're going to keep putting information. Uh, Don't forget, like, comment, subscribe. We appreciate you guys coming out. Uh, Caleb, man, enjoy your Friday. Enjoy your weekend. I will see you next week for another episode of Dirt to Dust. I'm out. You've been listening to Dirt to Dust. Presented by Outlaw Off-Road. The premier off-road centers for Jeeps, trucks, and SUVs. Sounds a little bit arrogant, doesn't it? Oh, well. We hope you've enjoyed the show. Make sure to like, rate, and review. Be sure to tell your friends about the show, too. We'll be back soon. But in the meantime, to see more and to see what Outlaw Off-Road offers, hit the website at theoutlawoffroad.com. See you next time. Don't follow us. You're not going to make it. (laughs) Thank <laughs> you.